Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 30, which is the last lecture for this particular course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In last two lectures, that is lecture 28 and 29, we have discussed about seismic vulnerability as well as seismic risk. In lecture 28, we have seen that based on the earlier understandings, whenever we are getting the value of seismic hazard, that is the expected level of ground shaking, expected level of earthquake loading during a particular earthquake or during a particular exposure period, which is likely to be experienced by a particular building, the building may undergo severe damages, it may undergo slight damages, there might be some kind of collapse also in the building. So, in order to forecast what potential level of damage can be experienced by a particular building during uh, likely to occur ground motion, taken into consideration the exposure period, which can be maybe 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, taking the seismicity as well as the condition of the building in its present situation, one can go ahead with assessment of seismic vulnerability and later on taking into account how much is the loading which is going to come and how much is the characteristics of the building with respect to codal provisions in terms of irregularities, in terms of plan and in terms of site conditions, what is the relative vulnerability of a particular building and then taking this into account taking exposure period into account, we can go ahead with risk assessment. In lecture 29, we discussed about primarily two methods are there on seismic vulnerability assessment. One is based on empirical method that is mostly like rapid visual screening, taking into account the codal provisions which are given. In rapid visual screening, we have to find out the type of the building, we have to find out what are the different parameters or the characteristics of the building, including codal detailing, site condition, whether it is located on liquefied site, whether it is located on non-liquefied site or site class 1, site class 2. Similarly, if there is any irregularity in terms of plan, there is any irregularity in terms of elevation that has to be observed carefully while going around a particular building or while observing number of buildings in a particular region for which vulnerability assessment is important. Taking the base score as we have discussed in lecture 29, taking the base score into account and successfully taking into account other properties also which is score modifier, one can determine the value of S that is the score based on rapid visual screening. Then corresponding to the value of S, there are the characteristics and the classifications given which based on which one can identify what level, what grade of damage with what probability, whether it is moderate probability, high probability or very high probability of grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, grade 5 kind of damage, which is likely to occur in a particular building whenever it is exposed to a certain earthquake loading condition corresponding to the seismic zone in which the building is located, corresponding to how the seismic zonation factor is getting modified corresponding to a given site condition corresponding to codal detailings. So, all those things we have discussed in lecture uh, 29. We have also seen two examples where two buildings were given and then taken into consideration where those buildings are located, which particular uh, seismic zones the buildings are located, what type of buildings are those, the corresponding value of base score was obtained. Then again observing with respect to the form which is available on Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, you go and observe different different specifications of the building in terms of maybe diaphragm, in terms of uh, uh, shear walls, maybe in terms of lightweight material, maybe in terms of wooden frame, you can find out specific details and correspondingly the score modifier. Finally, we got the value of score for both the buildings and depending upon the score be compared with respect to grade 1, grade 2 up to grade 5 corresponding to the score which corresponding grade uh, explaining the damage of the building was obtained. 
Now, this particular method that is rapid visual screening is primarily the method which is used for empirical un, uh, empirically understanding based on visual screening of a building and you do not require any specific uh, information as far as the earthquake characteristics are there or as far as the building characteristics are there because you are simply based on visual screening you are observing the building and based on the observation if you are finding specific characteristics of the building which are visualized uh, just by looking at the building from the outside and then you are reporting it. That is why when we were discussing about seismic vulnerability primarily based on rapid visual screening it was highlighted that many a times vulnerable buildings are highlighted as not vulnerable. Similarly, there are buildings which are found as vulnerable, but actually are not vulnerable. So, in both cases vulnerable can be found as a, a not vulnerable, non vulnerable building can be found as vulnerable building. And uh, also one has to take into account that person who is actually observing the characteristics which is given in the uh, forms is actually not an expert, it is the person might be trained for some time, so that he or she can go for uh, field observations. There are certain points which has to be taken into consideration before going for field observation or before planning for field observation, then you go to field. Later on you come back to the laboratory or whether you come back to your office and note down or look at the database which has been observed during a field investigation corresponding to different different buildings. So, this uh, uh, seismic vulnerability based on rapid visual screening or based on empirical methods are going to give you quickly a rough idea about the vulnerability of the building taken into consideration the importance of the building taken into consideration the history of the particular building taken into consideration the finance which has been put in a particular building construction and similarly other factors one can decide of course, taking into account the grade of damage which has been found based on empirical method one can go ahead and decide whether a detailed investigation is required where specific properties whether you are talking about numerical modeling of a building, whether you are talking about some experimental setup which may give you some demand of a particular building or a capacity of a particular building can be taken into consideration. That means, uh, if if uh, the if you are not dealing with quite important building you can directly go with or if you are dealing with routine buildings and try to find out the vulnerability you can go ahead with rapid visual screening and then accordingly what are the buildings which even appear to be vulnerable are found vulnerable then uh, uh, the corresponding authority may take a decision whether it is required to undergo retrofitting any other kind of strengthening is required or the building can be demolished. Before a particular earthquake loading is actually going to hit the building and similar consequences of damage which has been already indi uh, indicated based on rapid visual screening uh, meet at a particular site. So, that can be done and similarly if there are important buildings which cannot be uh, demolished or some important structures which based on rapid visual screening demands any kind of retrofitting or strengthening, then we can go ahead with uh, analytical methods which will exactly give you an idea about how much is the demand based on earthquake loading condition and taking into consideration the material characteristics, uh, uh, the position of beams, columns, reinforcement details, applied load one can actually go for design as well as analysis of a particular building. So, you can uh, take all the design parameters go for modeling a particular building again when we are going for modeling primarily these two kinds of load will come into picture uh, which we have also discussed in lecture 29. So, first is gravity load which will be there every time whenever we are talking about live load as well as dead load. In addition we are also talking about earthquake load. So, if we take into consideration the magnitude the live load dead load the magnitude is more or less defined, but whenever it comes to earthquake loading condition it is not only the magnitude, but also the variation in the magnitude over the period of time. Thirdly earthquake load is actually reversible in nature. So, sometime you are having uh, shaking in one direction 
and considering the earthquake loading condition is cyclic in nature. So, there will be cycles of loading and unloading or loading in one direction and subsequently loading in the reverse direction or almost in opposite direction. So, taking that into consideration, we can analyze corresponding to gravity load, we can analyze corresponding to in addition to gravity, how much earthquake load is going to be uh, transferred to a particular building. There also, whenever we are going for analysis, uh, primarily we can go with uh, static analysis taking uh, uh, maybe gravity load as well as some form of coefficients determining approximately how much earthquake loading is going to be applied. So, some uh, static uh, analysis or maybe pseudo static analysis can be performed. In addition, if you are going with dynamic analysis or taking into consideration the uh, formation of plastic hinges or restricting the yielding of the material as the ultimate stage for responding to the external loading condition, we can again restrict it to linear analysis and non-linear analysis. So, generally when we go for linear analysis, we are restricting it to uh, the elastic uh, range in which the material is going to offer resistance to external loading condition. Take into consideration may be representative uh, strength characteristics of the medium. At the on the contrary, if you are going with non-linear analysis, we will take actually the hysteresis loop, how the material properties, how the material strength properties are degrading or changing as the earthquake loading condition which is cyclic in nature is applied to a particular building. So, we can take into account maybe beams, columns, shear walls and other subsequent uh, uh, members which are going to offer resistance to earthquake loading condition. Either we can go with the linear analysis or we can go with non-linear analysis where we will see how the material characteristics with every cycle of loading is undergoing degradation or change in its strength characteristics or change in its resistance properties over the period of time for which earthquake loading has been actually applied to the uh, corresponding member. So, there you can go with the non-linear analysis and uh, find out what is the actual uh, capacity of a particular building and then compare with respect to the demand which you can get maybe from codal provision or you can get from seismic hazard analysis. So, in today's uh, lecture we will be discussing uh, again in brief about uh, what is uh, what is pushover analysis, how linear and non-linear analysis are generally taken into consideration to again uh, comment on the vulnerability of the building or to uh, get an understanding about the damage characteristics of a particular building. As I mentioned earlier also that it is not only the vulnerability, but at the same time uh, based on hazard analysis, if you have found out that a particular level of ground shaking is expected to be experienced by a building during its design life, then it is not only the magnitude of uh, ground motion characters, uh, uh, ground motion that is spectral acceleration, spectral velocity or spectral displacement, but at the same time one has to also take into consideration what are the ground motion characteristics which are also varying keeping in mind that the amplitude of your ground motion parameter is not changing. That means, you are having different magnitude of earthquake happening at different distance even these two combination can contribute to almost same amplitude of ground motion. Similarly, depending upon how far uh, your earthquake source is there with respect to your site what is the propagation medium characteristics, what is the medium which is available between bedrock and the surface, again your motion characteristics, primarily the duration as well as the frequency content and subsequently the amplitude also is going to change. So, how these three things that is amplitude, duration as well as frequency content all these three parameters of a particular ground motion corresponding to which the amplitude has been taken either referring to uh, uh, seismic zonation map or based on seismic hazard values. So, all these can also contribute significantly to the response of the same building you are applying maybe 0.2 g, you are applying maybe 0.25 g, 0.3 g, 0.36 g. So, the amplitude remains the same, but when you are going with non-linear analysis 
the characteristics of ground motion will also play an important role. So, we will take into account lot of such characteristics into account and try to find out with change in these characteristics how the response in terms of damage in terms of uh, uh, capacity or finally, in terms of damage it is changing in a particular building, it is changing in a particular infrastructure keeping in mind that the amplitude of loading is more or less remaining the same. So, uh, we will start with pushover analysis which will uh, help, uh, help us in understanding how much corresponding to an earthquake loading condition the maximum displacement in a building is induced taken into consideration the uh, characteristics of beams, columns and important load bearing members in a particular structure. So, pushover analysis is going to basically tell us corresponding to loading condition how is the response of a particular structure and uh, when we are talking about response primarily we are interested in displacement response of the structure. So, it is most popular as well as simplest method to perform nonlinear analysis as well as for uh, corresponding to a dynamic condition. So, it is also a static nonlinear method where you take approximately how much is the earthquake loading condition into account and then perform the analysis to find out uh, how the uh, may be story displacement or the overall displacement at the top if you are talking about the entire building. Uh, how the top uh, rooftop displacement is changing. Primarily, when we are talking about high rise building, the displacement based approach will govern the design. So, when we are going with pushover analysis, we have to take into account that with respect to the base shear, how the raw, uh, rooftop displacement is changing whenever earthquake loading, primarily static or uh, uniform. Uh, amplitude of earthquake loading is applied. If you want to take into account the actual ground motion uh, characteristics into account to understand the response of the building, we can go with uh, nonlinear time history analysis. So, there you will take into account how the amplitude of ground motion is also changing throughout the duration of earthquake shaking condition. <coughs> so, this is uh, it does not take into account the dynamic or reversal nature of uh, earthquake. That means, even if you are going with non-linear analysis, it will take into account the static part that means, the amplitude of loading is not going to change with respect to time, it is going to remain constant with respect to time and then you apply it in terms of primarily in terms of base shear as uh, given in uh, IS 1893 code and then you can uh, understand the response of a particular structure or response of a particular building. So, so, it does not take into account the dynamic characteristics or reversal of uh, uh, loading condition with respect to uh, uh, the time for which the earthquake shaking has been prominent. It considers mostly monotonical, uh, monotonically increasing load with, with respect to. Uh, so, this generally considers monotonic load which is applied to the base of the building. So, consider this is a critical example of a particular building where you can see this is a building at a particular site ground plus 3 which is given over here and subsequently we can go with uh, uh, more similar analogies which we will be drawing for this particular figure. So, here we can see uh, this is a building at a particular site the building based on uh, maybe you can say if you are referring to uh, zonation map then corresponding to which particular zone the building is located, then you will have other factors which will come into account and finally, you will be getting a value of base shear. That means, whenever earthquake loading is applied to a building finally, in the lateral direction because vertical direction earthquake shaking will be dominated or will be uh, uh, significantly substantiated by means of gravity. So, prominently earthquake loading condition in lateral direction will be more uh, uh, demanding as far as the capacity of the building is concerned. So, V b is going to be the base shear which is corresponding to earthquake loading 
and this earthquake loading if you are going with zonation map again uh, the zonation average horizontal design coefficient is given one can refer to those and can uh, determine the value of base shear again refer to the formulation given in the uh, codal provisions. If you are going with the seismic hazard analysis that means, you will be taking into account the site for which suppose this building is very important building or nuclear power plant is there. Then in addition to codal provision you can go with site specific studies. You collect information about past earthquakes which have happened in uh, specific radial distance how much that radial distance will be there that you can uh, check with corresponding code. So, 300, 500, even 1000 kilometer radial distance if it is required. So, within 1000 uh, kilometer radial distance how many earthquakes are known so far which have happened in the past starting with very recent earthquake where ground motion recording has started then you can go with those earthquakes for which damage or isosceles one maps are available, where you can report that depending upon the damage scenario, where if, if we can recall the earlier lectures, every time there is damage during a particular earthquake, this particular damage characteristics you can compare with respect to the damage scale or intensity scale and corresponding to uh, which level of intensity your site experience damage is matching that particular intensity value you can assign. So, similarly you will be having lot of uh, ISO seismal maps corresponding to those earthquakes for which ground motion record is not available because such earthquakes had happened much earlier than uh, the recording of ground motion had started. Then you can go ahead with uh, referring to older catalogs which might be talking about some earthquake happened maybe in 1500, 1200, 1100 and even before 1000 AD. So, there are certain catalogs also one can refer to which have also been uh, generated or created over the period of time taking different literatures suggesting some scenario of damage very much similar to what generally in today's world we are experiencing during a particular earthquake. So, based on this also people have found out uh, which is documented also that during a particular uh, year may be in 1100, 1200 something similar to uh, waves or may be materials. Uh, uh, damages at multiple location in a particular epicentral region were, were reported which was very much identical to earthquake occurrence. Then moreover you can also uh, gather information about historic earthquakes based on periodic vection investigations. Uh, this we had discussed when we were uh, uh, discussing about firstly on active and inactive faults. So, whenever we are going for active faults and to uh, demarcate the boundaries or possible location again we have to go ahead with what are the geomorphological and geological features available in a particular region which directly or indirectly indicating that there might be a possibility of particular fault in a particular region which might have triggered an earthquake in the longer run. So, maybe once maybe one earthquake maybe 2000 years back so might have been happened during that particular fault or you can go ahead with paleoliquefaction investigations, which is also discussed in earlier lectures. So, paleoliquefaction investigation will uh, we have to search for seismites, which will give an indication about some features which were created during historic earthquakes, maybe 700 years back, maybe 1500 years back, and remain intact because once the pore pressure dissipation, if you take into account sand dikes or sand blows after poor pressure dissipation which had happened during a particular earthquake these features or at least some portion of these features remain intact in some layers available beneath the ground surface. So, again based on that also uh, you will be getting more information about historic earthquake. So, collectively if you are going to determine base shear based on hazard analysis we will be having historic earthquake based on uh, pale liquefaction investigation we will have historic earthquake based on well established catalog. We will be having additional earthquake again uh, in terms of intensity maps or damage maps. Then we will be having earthquake which had happened very recently in last 50, 60, 70 years for which ground motion records are available in different parts of the globe. Collectively taking those into account and 
following the methodology which we have discussed in terms of deterministic and probabilistic hazard analysis, one can perform uh, corresponding hazard values uh, can be determined for a particular site of interest again rather than using zonation factors which are given in IS code, one can if, if you are going with site specific studies to determine the base shear you can refer to these C spring hazard values. Always take into account that whenever we are going with C spring hazard values and try to determine the value of base shear, make sure that the condition at which your building is located in order to find out base shear and the condition for which the particular C spring hazard values are given should be of corresponding to same site condition. Generally, the C spring hazard maps are available corresponding to bedrock condition. So, how that bedrock condition mo ground motions or seismic hazard values will be altered reaching to the same level where base shear is being calculated for these kinds of analysis has to be understood firstly accordingly the seismic hazard values will be modified and can be taken into consideration when you are going with scenario specific because now you will be getting the value of base shear corresponding to some scenario which can be worse scenario if you are going with deterministic hazard analysis, if you are going with probabilistic hazard analysis then again corresponding to 10 percent probability uh, of accidents in 50 years or 2 percent probability of accidents in 50 years you can find out how much is the uh, seismic hazard values. Take that into account ensuring that both are corresponding to same site condition you can utilize the formulations given in IS code to determine the value of base shear. So, generally here what we are trying to find out we are trying to assess how much is the arbitrarily applied or expecting to be applied base shear at the building because of an earthquake or take into consideration the seismicity of a region. So, this base shear is basically an indication of or a quantification of loading which has generated in some form because of earthquake and is applied at the base of this building. From here the building will be taking the shearing and it will be transferred to different different stories in terms of story shear which are given over here as Q 1, Q 2, Q 3, Q 4. So, at different different level as you are going away um, above the ground floor depending upon the stiffness there will be some distribution of story shear which will be actually the loading you are getting because of base shear or which is uh, measure of earthquake loading condition. Earthquake happened somewhere transferred to the building in terms of base shear then Q 1, Q 2, Q 3, Q 4 are the actual shear applied at each story which in order to prevent damage to the building these story shears Q 1, Q 2, Q 3, Q 4 has to be actually resisted by the beams by the columns which are available or additional members are there to raise this shearing. So, those members should also be taken into consideration. So, firstly you will determine the arbitrary base shear or the base shear which will be applied taking maybe the seismic zonation factor or uh, site specific seismic hazard study. So, base shear is basically quantification of maximum lateral force that will occur or that will be applied that will be mobilized due to seismic ground motion or seismic activity in a particular region and this maximum base shear will be applied at the base of your building. This base shear if you are referring to Indian standard code 1893 uh, came in 2002 and subsequent revisions are also there. So, we can find out this base shear as V b that is base shear which is given over here also this is the same value of base shear which is shown in the figure also and same is shown in the equation also. But overall based on the design response factor which is given in uh, Indian standard codes it is it is basically referring to this particular equation you are going to get how much is the demand expecting from your building corresponding to a given earthquake loading condition. So, zonation factor or zone factor it is the factor to obtain design spectrum depending upon perceived maximum seismic risk characterized by maximum considered earthquake. 
So, directly we can take um, uh, corresponding to different zones also maximum considered earthquake is also can be find out uh, in the zone in which the structure is located. So, you have to find out which particular city or which particular zone your building is located accordingly one can refer to table 2 of IS 1893 2002 and get the value of zone factor. Similarly, importance factor it is a factor used to obtain the design seismic forces depending upon the functional use of the structure. Structure can be same, but depending upon the functional use of the structure depending upon the hazard consequence in case the structure undergoes failure. So, there is a routine building where people are living and then there is nuclear power plant where radiations are contained definitely both will have drastically different set of uh, consequences in case undergo failure. So, routine building undergoes failure there might be casualties uh, restricting to uh, primarily the intended users. So, that will be the corresponding damage because of that particular building, but if you are going with respect to nuclear power plant if there is leak of uh, radiation then it will be total catastrophe. So, definitely the importance of those structure will be much higher in comparison to the routine buildings. So, one can refer to table 6 of uh, IS 1893 and find out what will be the importance factor corresponding to the building you are dealing with. Response reduction factor as I mentioned earlier also. So, this is a factor by which the actual base shear that would be generated if the structure were to remain in elastic limit. So, that means, you are how, how much response should be allowed in a structure such that the component will remain in elastic limit and primarily it is corresponding to the design basis earthquake that is DBE. Uh, this is like the scenario even in probabilistic hazard analysis corresponding to a given probability of accidents in uh, uh, defined return period there are definition to find out maximum predictable earthquakes, CF shutdown earthquake, design basis earthquake. So, one can refer to design basis earthquake the value of response reduction factor you can find out from table 7 of IS 1893 2002 particularly for Indian subcontinental scenario. Then average response reduction uh, average response acceleration coefficient that is SA by G as I mentioned earlier there are design uh, response spectra there so corresponding to the site condition at which a building is located and corresponding to natural period of the building firstly you can pick up a particular graph and then on the graph on x axis corresponding to the natural period of the structure you can draw a vertical line where this line is touching your uh, appropriate graph whether it is corresponding to 1, 2, 3 type of site condition you can find out the value of average response acceleration coefficient. So, taking those into account you can find out the value of base shear and then corresponding to base shear you will go to step 2 that is to distribute the base shear along the height. You have applied shear to the base and then it is being imparted to the entire building considering the stiffness which is changing across the height. The base shear will also be redistributed to different different heights in the building as shown over here and then depending upon the uh, uh, shear applicable to a particular height and the resistance offered by the members on that particular height collectively it will add some form of deformation from that particular height. If you remember our discussion a uh, couple of slides back whenever we are going for pushover analysis we are trying to find out corresponding to the base shear which is applied over here how much is the total displacement at the top of the building because that is a representation of the maximum response building is going to show corresponding to a given base shear. So, you go with distribution of base shear along the height this distribution should be as close approximation to what happened during a particular earthquake. So, we, we have well established formulation based on which we can distribute the base shear to different different heights. Now, if you are going with nonlinear analysis or if you are considering that this particular building can be approximated to uh, different number of lump mass systems when these lump mass system will be exposed to external loading condition then going ahead with our basic understanding with respect to single degree freedom system or multiple degree of freedom system we know that depending upon the frequency content 
or harmonic motion which are present in your external loading condition and how many number of degree of freedom which is available in a particular building you can have approximately some fundamental mode as well as higher modes in which the building is going to respond or different stories are going to respond or the locations which are uh, uh, having the inertial force or where the mass is concentrated at different different uh, uh, stories of a building definitely these mass will undergo deformations these mass will undergo some movement in terms of response of the building corresponding to external loading condition. So, if we look into the governing equations for single degree of freedom system we can find out how much is the natural frequency of the building both in case of damped as well as undamped system. Similarly, if you are going with uh, multiple story buildings we can approximate it or we can approximate the response of this building with respect to MDUF system or multiple degree of freedom system. Taking Eigen values and Eigen vectors we can find out what are the different natural frequencies and corresponding to these natural frequency how the mode shapes of these buildings are going to be corresponding to a given earthquake loading condition or corresponding to a number of sets of harmonic motion depending upon the choice of the analyst. So, certainly we will be having fundamental mode which might be giving uh, best approximate uh, uh, mode shape with respect to the uh, actual response of the building during particular uh, loading condition. There can be higher modes also depending upon what sort of analysis you are doing here and uh, what mode you are basically targeting to find out. So, hence the distribution is in proportion to fundamental mode. If you are talking about only focusing on the fundamental mode, the distribution of base shear will be in proportion to the fundamental mode or what is the contribution of each of these story stiffness in order to govern the fundamental mode or mode shapes corresponding to the fundamental mode. So, based on which you can find out the story shear taking the base shear into account taking the stiffness values into account the mass values the stiffness values and even the damping values one can go for the solution of multiple degree of freedom system governing equation. Pushover analysis is required which is also called as single mode analysis where you corresponding to uh, given base shear you will try to find out different beams different columns which are going to now resist corresponding to the applied base shear. So, what will be the response of those important components whenever this base shear uh, the story shear of q 1, q 2, q 3 are applied to each of these members. So, what actually will happen if you go ahead with like all the members are uh, 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 simply providing resistance corresponding to shear and uh, base shear and then successfully you can see that it is subsequently uh, whatever base shear you have applied there is corresponding displacement at the rooftop. So, conventional if you are going with linear method that means you are considering that all the material which is available to offer resistance to this external loading condition will only offer resistance within el uh, elastic limit or whatever base shear you have applied corresponding to this base shear the loading in the material will be ensured to remain within the elastic limit of the properties of the material. So, in such a case you can find out that as you are going away from the base shear or as you are going up and up in the building corresponding to base shear the displacement value is increasing. So, you can find out based on your pushover and analysis a plot between base shear that means how much shear you have applied how much external loading condition uh, corresponding to the seismicity you have applied at the base and uh, successfully you uh, subsequently you have found out the value of uh, uh, story shear and corresponding to the story shear you have find out based on linear analysis how much will be the displacement at particular story and subsequently at the top of the building. So, based on pushover analysis in, in initial state you will find out how the variation in uh, rooftop displacement is happening as a function of change in the base shear values. Always keep in mind this particular plot is corresponding to linear elastic deformation of 
critical components of this particular building or any particular component of this particular building, take into account that these components are uh, loaded only up to the elastic limit. So, whatever deformations are there in the building, you remove base shear and then the material will come back to its original position. We are not taking at this stage, we are not taking any uh, plastic hinge formation or any kind of yielding in any particular material. Then, but in actual uh, primarily if you are talking about earthquake loading condition, firstly it is reversal in nature, secondly it is dynamic as well as it will be applied over a period of time. So, it may be uh, depending upon what is the duration of shaking at least that is the duration in which this particular loading will be active on a particular building. So, definitely there will be because of this cycle of reversal of stresses there might be some degradation in the material characteristics if you are going with non-linear analysis or if you are taking the hysteresis loop which is defining the degradation in the material characteristics when the material is subjected to a given earthquake loading condition. So, what will happen over here particularly uh, in this particular case in actual there will be formation of plastic hinges, there will be some components of beams, column which will undergo uh, yielding that will under. Uh, so, corresponding to that initially you have applied some base shear, but correspond once you do the linear analysis you will find out impairing the non-linearity also into account because that is the actual way in which the response has to be there. So, what you will do the plot of base shear versus uh, uh, rooftop displacement which was shown as linear was primarily because we have taken the linear method of analysis, but if you are going with non-linearity because all the components which are offering resistance are actually offering resistance in non-linear nature. So, base shear in such a case cannot go on increasing uh, with the ro rooftop. So, there cannot be uh, increase in the rooftop displacement with increase in the base shear because if you keep on increasing the base shear definitely your strain energy corresponding to uh, as well as the shear strain which will be imparted to different different stories will also change. When the, the shear strain level is changing definitely we cannot ensure that for each value of shear strain whether it was too low whether it was intermediate or whether it was too high definitely the linear component will not be ensured as given in the previous plot of base shear versus rooftop displacement. So, we have to take into consideration the non-linear nature maybe we can approximate with respect to the uh, uh, approximate degradation properties, but certainly that has to be taken into consideration because when we are going with uh, understanding the building response definitely we know that earthquake loading condition is going to induce a significant level of non-linearity in the material or the material when it will be subjected to loading because of earthquake induced waves certainly that will take the material to non-linear part. So, that part will take into consideration as a result when we take the non-linearity of important components into account there will be yielding in the material as a result there will be formation of plastic hinges. So, one can apply the demand. So, initially there was you applied the base shear and found out the story shear and corresponding to that you found out rooftop displacement taking only the linear part. Now, taking non-linear part we can again go for finding out the component which are uh, undergoing failure and then we can find out the moment capacity. Suppose this is a point which has actually uh, subjected to yielding this is a first point which has subjected to yielding or there is formation of plastic hinges. So, definitely this component this particular dot when there is plastic hinge formation definitely the moment capacity there will be a redistribution. Subsequently, this will have effect on the rooftop displacement. So, whenever the design capacity ratio is maximum that particular point is indication of the member which is yielding. So, this will go on in, uh, in uh, iterative manner you found out first then again you go for the analysis you may find out another uh, location in which the demand capacity has reached that is indication that the other member has also yielded keeping the base shear as same, but changing in the 
response of the material, the material is not only linear, but subsequently depending upon the shear strain mobilized in the material, it is also going to non-linear part. Subsequently, there will be, so you continue this particular part, there will be plastic formation, plastic hinge formation at the location where the demand capacity has reached to its maximum. The base shear will be recalculated because every time there is yielding in the material, the resistance from a particular storage shear is going to change. Definitely, this is going to have direct effect on your story wise displacement and subsequently the displacement at the top of the building. And remember, we are going to decide the damage characteristics of the building primarily take into consideration uh, the capacity of the building in terms of uh, rooftop displacement. So, pushover analysis is going to give us the capacity curve which is in terms of rooftop displacement, how it is changing with respect to base shear. So, base shear is an indication of earthquake loading condition and rooftop displacement is representation of the response of the building in terms of formation of plastic hinges at different different level all throughout the building height. So, this way one can get base shear and corresponding to base shear may be first point of yielding, second point and subsequently. So, this is the first point of yielding, you will get to know that at corresponding to first point of yielding what is the deformation. Repeat the same exercise, you will get more points along the beams and the columns which are undergoing yielding. Accordingly, the stiffness value corresponding to each story will be revised take into consideration the points of last, uh, plastic hinge formation. Again, there will be base shear and corresponding the response to each and every uh, story will be recalculated at the same time. So, here we can see that as plastic hinge formation has happened, the uh, roof top displacement or the displacement you are getting at the top of the roof corresponding to applied base shear will not remain as linear because of more and more hinge formation. That means, the response of the building will significantly reduce rather than the same response which was shown for linear analysis. So, this is shown over here. So, we can see delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 it is basically in iterative manner. You are finding out as you keep on increasing more and more base shear, there will be increase in the locations of plastic hinge formation and subsequently that will have effect on your rooftop displacement values. So, based on this curve which was base shear versus rooftop displacement based on non-linear analysis, but only take into consideration the formation of the hinges that means, we are not so far taking into consideration uh, uh, the duration of loading. So, this continues un until uh, all the beams and the columns are developing plastic hinges. That means, this is actual response, non-linear response uh, of your building for an applied base shear. Now, in addition, we will also take into a con a consideration that there is a building and whenever there is increase in the load, there is gravity load also which is there applied to the building. So, which will also prevent too much of displacement going here and there with respect to the mean position of the building. So, that will have a negative stiffness which will be imparted to the building. So, taking the gravity load as well as the non-linear response of the building again related to pushover analysis, one can find out the capacity curve. So, overall curve that means, you will take into account the gravity load, you will also take into account how with respect to base shear the rooftop displacement is changing from story shear alone. So, collectively both by merging both the responses we will get to get this particular plot which is on x axis you are having rooftop displacement, how this rooftop displacement is going to change from linear to non-linear to non-linear plus uh, uh, cell weight of the or, or the vertical load which is applied and then corresponding to this is a function of how with respect to base shear your your displacement value is changing. So, you can see initially the value was more and as you are going to increase the base shear again and again, the rooftop displacement has shown significant reduction. 
So, this is going to be defining the capacity curve of a particular building. Loading condition was corresponding to the seismic design response spectra, which, which one can pick up corresponding to the zonation map, corresponding to the importance and so on. So, capacity curve it is basically, so based on uh, the capacity curve which we have defined so far, where base shear is there on y axis and rooftop displacement is there on x axis, primarily three set of this is the basically the characteristics of the building for which you are trying to find out the demand during earthquake loading condition. Based on this all stages of damages, so how you are going to define damages again you can refer to the codal provisions, but you can typically find out three stages of damages. So, here based on ATC 1996 and FEMA 1997, three stages of damage have been defined in this particular plot itself. Now, this is like going to give you an overall capacity of your building, overall capacity curve of your building depending upon what level of base shear you are dealing with, you can pick up whether your building should be which because this plot is defined based on the response of the building. Now, when overall plot is there, so this is going to be the locus of all the responses. This is now you can locate keeping in mind what is the base shear your building is going to be exposed, you can locate whether it is corresponding to immediate occupancy. That means, after repair and cleaning work you can go and immediately occupy the building, because the building is offering the resistance in terms of roof displacement much much lower than the uh, tolerable limit. Again based on base shear, if you are reaching to L s that means, life safety which indicates that till the time the building is exposed to the given earthquake loading condition you can stay, but not after that. Third one is collapse prevention that means, the building or the expected loading condition is such high that corresponding rooftop displacement itself is very high, uh, both from strength point of view, even you can refer to the serviceability point of view. Finally, the, uh, the observation with respect to building is that the building is on the verge of failure or verge of collapse, certainly you cannot occupy that particular building. You can take appropriate measure in terms of how to deal with the building, uh, taking the finance which will be required and the importance of the building. So, this is going to be the capacity curve, we are having capacity curve which is going to be the response of the building, but actually at a particular site you are also having the demand curve. So, collectively comparing both design curve, uh, demand curve which is a characteristics of earthquake loading condition and capacity curve which is the characteristics of how for different set of loading condition your building is going to respond, whether it is immediate occupancy, whether it is life cycle, whether it is complete collapse. So, you can compare both the things, uh, uh, the demand curve is in plot of spectral acceleration versus time plot which is given in uh, Indian standard code also, uh, using that we can find out the demand and the capacity curve is definitely the base shear versus rooftop displacement. So, identical if you put both the curves one over the other, you call it as acceleration displacement response spectrum ADRS. So, it is going to tell us uh, what is the relative comparison between the displace, uh, the demand curve as well as the capacity curve or overall what is the performance of a structure that can be evaluated based on acceleration displacement uh, response spectrum. Nonlinear an analysis I as I mentioned that whenever we are going with uh, push over analysis whether you are limiting to linear or nonlinear you are taking you are not taking the uh, ground motion characteristics completely as it is given in during a particular earthquake. So, non-linear analysis again you can go with static analysis, you can target for single mode primarily the fundamental mode, hence it is only applicable to the building in which fundamental mode is more dominating or having more contribution, but there can be uh, uh, condition where even in addition to fundamental mode one has to go with the higher modes. So, certainly you have to take into account non-linear time history analysis, which will be actually the dynamic analysis where multiple modes not only the fundamental mode, but higher modes are also taken into consideration to find out overall the response of the building. So, here you will take complete time history of a particular building 
in order to decide uh, the capacity of a particular building or response of a building. You can if you are going with performance based analysis, you can go with or you are if you are going with the fragility curve development, you can go with a lot more time histories corresponding or acceleration, um, uh, acceleration time histories defining or approximating the seismicity uh, anticipated at your site of interest during the given exposure period. Again you can go with the uh, in the plastic hinges as I mentioned earlier you can go with complete hysteresis loop which will go in, which is going to give you that during the loading condition with respect to time how the degradation in the material properties whether it is at beam level whether it is at uh, column level and subsequently at each story level it is going to change as far as the formation of plastic hinges are uh, concerned. So, such thing you can go with nonlinear time history analysis and there are certain details what has to be dealt with whenever we are dis discussing with respect to uncertainty. So, there are some uncertainty with respect to records, some uncertainty with respect to model, uh, material properties and dimensions. Fragility analysis it is again going to give you uh, an understanding or correlation between how the damage are correlated with respect to the. So, I am not going to much detail into this particular part because this is just to give you an overview. So, fragility curve it is basically a continuous representation of probability of a particular level of damage with respect to earthquake intensity measure. So, as the intensity of earthquake is changing what is the probability of failure how it is varying. So, that for any expected level of ground shaking which is likely to be experienced to your building whether it is during design basis earthquake, maximum credible earthquake or any specific scenario earthquake you can have an idea about what is the probability of uh, uh, that the damage will exceed a particular uh, user defined uh, or codal provision defined uh, state. So, you can see over here just an idea based on the capacity curve also you can define uh, the damage in terms of uh, I mean this is in terms of intensity measure. So, this is fragility curve you can decide slight moderate extensive and collapse. So, once you are having the uh, fragility curves you can refer to this and find out generally you can go for fragility curve analysis taking lot of analysis changing the ground motion characteristics and then you can come up with this fragility curves. So, with this I have come to the end of uh, this particular discussion uh, that means, what is the meaning of uh, seismic vulnerability and this subsequently can be uh, carried forward to uh, go ahead with risk assessment analysis. I have given some overview about what is risk and once you have detailed information about the intended users for a particular building you can continue with the uh, risk assessment. So, overall this was the uh, about the part 3 of seismic vulnerability and risk. So, thank you everyone.